Billy Day coming at you live from Billy Day's Barbecue, Greenville, North Carolina. It's 7.35 a.m. Hog's been on the cooker since 4. Now I'm about to have my second cup of coffee and see if anyone has a question for me this morning on Barbecue and A with Billy Day. I hope y'all having a good one so far. Too early for trouble, right? Gracious, looks like we... I don't think I've ever seen this many questions queued up. Better get to it. From Bayou Dave. Hey, Billy, my uncle used to say baby back ribs come from the backs of baby pigs. Was it full of it? Dave, I hate to get between you and a blood relative, but it is a well-documented fact that since the year 2033, uncles have been the leading source of disinformation in this country. So, no. Baby back ribs are cut from where the rib meets the spine after the loin is removed. They are smaller ribs, but they do not come from baby pigs. Next up. Maybe later. No. I'm trying to find ones pertaining specifically to barbecue. Ah, here's one from Tar Heel 23. Hey, Billy, what's better, Lexington style or East Carolina sauce? Well, Tahil, you know we don't talk politics here on Barbecue and Name. But I will just observe... No. That here in Lexington, we use a ketchup-based sauce to cover up the flavor of our meat. Whereas in East Carolina... Here we pick a... Vinegar, pepper, and a little love is all you need to bring out that natural hog flavor. Goodness gracious me, it seems like y'all having trouble concentrating on the... <laughs> ah, here's one from Rick and Monroe. Hey, Billy, two questions. First, there's a new pit master in town swears hot and fast is the way to go. Is that even barbecue? Well, you know me, I'm all about low and slow, but uh, it's a big world out there, Rick. Maybe you just have to take a bite, see what you think, you know? Next question. What's going to happen when your people take over? Well, Rick, I guess you ask him, like everyone else this morning, about the 2040 census results. First off, let's just... Okay. There's a chance, because of the 2020 and the 2030 undercounts, that when the new numbers come out this week, white folks will make up for less than 50% of the U.S. population. Now, this does not, okay, contrary to what you're hearing, this does not automatically mean our team gets to keep the ball from now on. Or that we even are a team, which I guarantee we are not. But if we were, and we decided to even the score, I still think white folks are going to be just fine. Okay, now, now, why do you say that, Billy? Hold on, I, I got to check on these. Now, this is just me speaking. But folks that come in here, they are all kinds, and barbecue tends to bring out the best. So maybe I'm being too whatever here, but I don't think white folks got to worry about us treating you like you. I just don't see it. <laughs> but if we did, Sorry, that just, you know, if you did find yourself in that position of things being stacked against you, then all you got to do is, like, copy us. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to reinvent how to behave and how to cope because we already worked that out. I can tell you right now, off the top of my head, Billy Day's top five tips for white people 
once you're the minority. Ready? Number one, don't ride with your music too loud. If you do, keep your windows up so nothing comes flying in at you. And number two, when it comes to being good, you're going to have to resituate your mind because good is not good enough anymore. You're going to have to work harder and be smarter than everyone around you. Which brings me to number three. <laughs> if you're going to argue with somebody, you got to do it calmly. And if that somebody really pisses you off, you got to explain calmly why you are upset. Number four, always say yes sir, no sir. Yes ma'am, no ma'am. I would get popped, oh, sorry. I would get slapped in my mouth by my parents if I did not respond with a sir or a ma'am to people. Now I was told it was out of respect for your elders. Till one day a friend of mine told me, no, that's what's expected from your superiors. Even today, some of you hear me say, sir and ma'am, you say, please call me Jimmy. Please call me Sarah. Some of you hear me say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You walk away, standing taller, nose up. A little smile. Did I make you feel better about yourself? Still grateful there's people like me out there in the world who know their where they belong. Number five. If you really want to be a high functioning member of the minority community, you've got to learn to live with fear every day of your life. Got it? That fear comes from living while white. Now, if all of that makes you nervous, like, oh, Billy, what are you talking about? I can never do those things. But just think about rock and roll, hip hop, Jazz, barbecue. You all catch on quickly when you want to. All you got to do is pay attention, like we do. everyone. <laughs> my name is Penny, uh, as you can see by my little name down here. Uh, it's not only my name, it's my self-worth. <laughs> Welcome to the Comedy Training Center. And this is the first of a six-week sequence I would like to call Comedy Techniques for Sad Times. I will teach you the basics of comedy so you don't look as suicidal as you feel. You can also up your social media game and instigate sassy banter over Zoom, according to our website. <laughs> um, I, I can't see you or, or hear you. So if you can see or hear me, would you put your little uh, comment in the box down there? 
Okay. Oh. Oh. And we're good. All right, a little more about me. After three years and thousands of dollars, I finally finished my master comedian training online last fall. <laughs> I wasn't really aiming to be a teacher. I mean, nobody really thinks I'm funny. <laughs> except for me. <laughs> but then COVID-42 hit and all the instructors died. So here I am. <laughs> but I made it. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> you see, that's what we call British humor. <laughs> but we'll get into that later. <laughs> oh, God. I look terrible. Is the lighting bad in here? Or am I the next one to die? <laughs> you see, that's what we call gallows humor. It's very important in these difficult times. I, I, hang on, I, I just need to, to get some better lighting in here, okay? I just hate staring at myself, you know? That, yeah, that's better. And the longer I do, oh, the worse it gets. Maybe I need to like start exfoliating or, or get, get some moisturizer or something. Oh well, at least I'm not dead yet. <laughs> That's what we call a callback. <laughs> I referenced that line at the beginning of this lecture from Monty Python's Holy Grail. Did you get that? Did you? Yeah. Did you follow me? <laughs> okay. All right. Moving along. Oh, oh, oh! I got a uh, comment from Queen of Farts 18. Uh, she or he is telling me to um, use uh, an SPF 400 in the day, followed by an ashwagandha vitamin C and. Ca Cow placenta pack at night. Does that really work? Because I will seriously do it, even though it sounds gross. I mean, I hate my jawline these days. Like, what, what is that? Ugh. Just send me the link, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, <clears throat> out of balance and uh, surprising are two good tenets of comedy. And uh, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Out of balance and surprising are two tenets of comedy. So, uh, for example, like when a woman with a large butt bends over, it's uh, the woman with a small butt is not funny, but but a big butt on full display, well, that that is funny. <laughs> yeah. Should I be saying woman? I mean, I, I don't want to be genderist. They didn't cover this in the training. Why is it funny to laugh at a big butt? I mean, is that fair? I feel like that's fat shaming. I really feel off my game. Uh, I think my blood sugar's low. Come with me. Let's make some toast. Okay. Toast is one of the last pure good things, you know? And I just bathe it in butter. Mm -mm -mm. I was gluten-free for about a month. Worst month of my life. Thank goodness I don't have an allergy like my friend. She eats one piece of bread, farts all day. No kidding. Sorry to stray off topic. Here we go. So out of balance and surprising, two great tenets of comedy. So when you are engaging with others, think about how you can investigate. Sorry, hang on. Yep. Yep. No. You can't talk to him, David, because he is quarantining. Well, I'm not the one who took him across the border. No, no, you can't talk to him because I am teaching class right now. I am teaching class. Yes, it is the comedy thing. And don't, don't you dare patronize me, David. Don't you dare. This comedy thing is paying the bills right now. Because I don't want to go down to the yurt in my hazmat suit just to get Slater so he can listen to you talk about yourself. No, I know. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what's wrong with you today. I just... <laughs> yeah, I will. Okay, I will. Okay. All right, bye. Jerk. It's funny how the pandemic, I mean, the last one, you were all, what, um, nine or 10 back then? <laughs> yeah. Some of you, some of you older students may remember. The world was so free back then. Preco, as the kids say. Yeah. Preco was, uh, 
It wasn't great. It was just different. Yeah, I'd say it was better, right? especially marriage. It's one thing being married when you're, um, you leave the house at night and you just go, you've got your space, you do your weird habits and you sing your weird cat songs alone. But when you're stuck together, it is a different thing. Those weird habits are happening right in front of you and they are disturbing. I mean, he is eating cereal in bed. He's leaving his toenails on the sink. Meanwhile, you can't sleep because you're full of anxiety. You gain 15 pounds from all the stress eating and this goes on for years. And then, and then one day your husband decides to diddle the neighbor without using a condom or, or a mask. You know, I think I was more upset about the mask. <laughs> he says he did it because he misses his freedom, but, um, you miss yours too. I mean, just the freedom to show your face seems revolutionary. You've forgotten how to be free, so uh, you take a comedy class to shake things up, and here you are, wondering what the hell happened and how you're supposed to teach comedy when the entire world is a nightmare garbage diaper. Anyway. <clears throat> no more distractions. I'm going to turn this off, okay? Sorry, just, I can't, um, why won't this do? <sighs> okay, I'm just, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go hide it, okay? Wah! Um. Pratfalls, <laughs> we'll get to those next week. <laughs> okay, uh, that's from Boss Lady. No personal monologues, okay, and no nihilism. Okay, okay, fine. I'm just, I'm just gonna put it right here. Yep. Okay, moving on. So, we've covered surprises and uh, being out of balance in British humor and gallows humor. And now it's time to work on the history of comedy. So, um, historically, there were funny people in the past. Um, Liz Estrada and all the phalluses. And, oh, sorry. Uh, Dingo ate my baby is asking, what is a phallus? Well, a phallus is just another name for a penis. <laughs> like that. You see, that's a penis. That's a phallus too. They're the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the Egyptians invented the visual joke. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen their deities? They are hilarious. <laughs> There's this one with the front paws of a lion and the head of a crocodile and the big butt of a hippo. Uh, <laughs> you see, big butts are funny. Did I tell you about the patron saint of comedy, St. Lawrence? Yeah, he's also the patron saint of cooks. So uh, here's the deal with St. Lawrence. He was being roasted over an open fire uh, like a rotisserie chicken uh, when he said to the Romans, hey jerks, I'm done on this side, flip me over. <laughs> That is a great joke for a guy being roasted alive. Mm. You know, I think we can learn something from St. Lawrence's book. When things are awful, we can always find something to laugh at, even if it's our own destruction. That's really weird. I, when I was telling you that about St. Lawrence, I kept smelling smoke. Isn't the mind so strange? Oh shit, my toast. Um, uh, so, um, uh, my, my kitchen is on fire right now, so uh, I've got to go, uh, but we'll do this next week. Um, uh, uh, please don't fire me. Fire! 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 Bobby gave me a little statue of the patron saint of the United Estates. It's a guardian angel who's watching over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Nuestra Señora de Libertad sat on a shelf beside a globe full of snow. The Arabian Night, La Cartilla del Escolar Dominicano, is a jefe's manual with rules for kids to live by. Nuestra Señora watched over me with her star halo, her 
white robe like a guardian angel's. Instead of rolling eyeballs on a platter like Santa Lucia or a, or a flaming sword like San Miguel or a baby Jesus in her arms like La Virgencita de la Gracia, Libertad held a big book just for writing down our petitions. I prayed for toys, candy, snow from the rich country to our north. Bobby's prayers came true. And we escaped to Nueva York. Refugees from El Jefe. I learned her English name. Lady Liberty wore a crown and a long gown like a beauty queen in Miss America. And carved on the cover of her book was the birth date of my new country. July IV, MDCCLXXVI. Teacher said no one knew if the rest of the pages were blank. And she had us take turns guessing. The American Knights, a manual of rules for USA kids to live by. On TV, people were marching, attacked by dogs, bludgeoned by clubs, hosed down like a fire inside a blazing building. I asked Bobby, was it true we had escaped the dictatorship? This year, I can't bring myself to sing happy birthday to you. Though I've been singing it for 20 seconds for months every time I wash my hands. New rules to safely live by in these times of a pandemic. While another rage is on. It's a virus of violence against our darker brothers and sisters, still marching, unable to breathe with knees on their necks in our name. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. That's time enough to wash our hands of the matter 26 times. How old will Liberty be before her tablet runs out of pages, filling with the names of brothers and sisters still waiting for their prayers to be answered, for enough breath to sing happy birthday, sweet Liberty? The nameless at her borders with Bobby's brown face and bigotes, whose America was co-opted, the accent erased from the E, as ours is the only America. Her book has become a graveyard. Her torch, the fires raging in cities. If we celebrate next year, which liberty will we sing to?
Someone must have been telling lies about me. For one fine morning, when I awoke in my modest six bedroom, 7,000 square foot house on Tracy Place, to find that without ever having done anything wrong, or right for that matter, without really ever having done anything at all, except run a major metropolitan newspaper into the ground and kick thousands of poor people out of their apartments, I, Jared Kay, was being put in charge of the nation's pandemic response. Nothing like this had ever, ever happened to me before. Except for that time, I was put in charge of the border wall and opioids and prison reform and presidential pardons and the Middle East peace process. I better get someone in authority to help me, I thought to myself. There was no one in authority to turn to. That night, I was asked to stand beside the podium in the briefing room and wait for my turn at the microphone. It was prime time. The camera, as it trailed over us, seemed to be eyeing me with bland curiosity, as if it both did and did not expect something from me. Some comprehensive answer, perhaps. Some consoling truth. But what? It was a feeling I remembered from my bar mitzvah, for which I wore, more or less, come to think of it, the same suit. That same atmosphere of suspended significance, of enduring expectation. That same knowledge that everyone there had come together on this occasion to hear me decode from the lectern the coiled and inscrutable scrolls of the law. Only, what was the law? Why did it seem at once so precise and so obscure? Where were the vowels? Where was the rabbi my parents had paid to help me? Now, as then, I felt myself exposed before an unruly and critical crowd. I tried to compose my face into an expression of purposefulness, or failing that, into any expression at all. But my face was like putty. My features, for all their placid symmetries, refused to move. Had they ever moved? Perhaps they had forgotten how. Or perhaps, it's difficult to say, they found no profit in movement and were content to remain as they were. The cooler I am, the better in the end, I thought. I, there were, I gathered, certain laws of the land that uh, pertain to situations such as a pandemic, though not being a trained lawyer, nor a trained epidemiologist, nor really a trained anything, I was unaware of them. Nonetheless, I gathered such laws surely must exist. <laughs> and after all, we live, or used to live, in a country with a legal constitution. At last, it was my turn at the podium. The eyes of the audience were so tensely fixed upon me, so hungry for whatever knowledge I was about to impart, that for a moment I merely stood there in silence, as I had no knowledge at all to speak of. Fellow citizens, I said, I have arrived and am in charge. A burst of applause followed from the right side of the hall. Bravo, someone shouted, clapping his hands high in the air. These people are easy to win over, I thought. It was elating to hear such breathless attention. In the stillness, I heard a, a subdued electrical hum that was more thrilling than the wildest applause. The only problem was the Silence from the left half of the room, from which I heard one or two isolated jeers and a few muttered whisperings of, holy shit, we're all going to die. Nonetheless, I tried to retain my composure. I considered what I might say to win over the whole of the audience once and for all. There can be no doubt that behind this committee, there is a great organization at work. Two organizations, actually with a tremendous number of hotels and golf courses around the world, and also quite a few luxury office buildings, in which, it should be noted, there is currently no little commercial space available at quite a reasonable price. At this point, I heard, or thought I heard, the sound of someone snickering. 
Suddenly I faltered. What faces these were around me. Had I been mistaken? Had I been too confident? Had I overestimated the effectiveness of my speech? That by bringing innovative solutions to these hard problems, we will continue to make progress. These are unusual times. A lot of things are happening very quickly, and we want to keep updating our models and, and, and making sure that we're making informed decisions uh, and informed recommendations and uh, based on the data that we are able to collect and focus on all the things that need to happen to make sure that we can, that we can um, deliver. Uh... But by now I had lost the thread. What was it we were supposed to deliver exactly? A hand went up in the back of the room. Who was it? My wife? A doctor? Someone who sympathized with my plight and wanted to help. I cleared my throat. <clears throat> my father-in-law was glaring again. It was what he did best. The room had no windows. It was difficult to breathe. Maybe I could use a ventilator, I thought. Was that a bad thing to think? Who was going to tell me what was good and what was bad? It seemed I, I could not completely rise to the occasion after all. It seemed I lacked the strength, the, the expertise, any sort of clue what I was doing or how to do it. I stood there at the lectern, my mouth opening and closing like a fish. I felt a constriction in my chest, a punitive tightness that might have been shame. Was this what shame felt like? It was difficult to see past the cameras, which for their part remained all too attentive. I felt their eyes bearing down on me. I felt them taking my measure in their steady, unblinking way. I felt as if they were appraising my actions for some future report, some cold and terrible judgment forming out beyond the horizon of everything I thought I could see. Someone must have been telling lies about me. Hi, my name is Emily. I am an alcoholic. I have now been sober, not quite 23 hours, I know, not a full day, but what the hell, here's my one day pin. <laughs> Today was my day off and I spent it alone watching movies. I watched Alien. And the weirdest thing to me was how optimistic it is. I mean, I get it. Super predacious monster with acid for blood and the jaws of a chainsaw wants to kill seven people and a cat on some crappy space tug. But, but, the movie was made in 1979. And it's set in 2037. And the premise is that we're actually mining stuff in other galaxies. Traveling to other galaxies. And 2037 is only seven years from now. We're not gonna be traveling even to Mars in seven years. A lot of us won't even be traveling to the local 7-Eleven for a frozen burrito we can nuke. Or that very special 7-Eleven sushi. Yum. I was drunk through most of COVID-22 and COVID-23. What was the last one? 25? But, hope. I know everyone loves that Emily Dickinson line, hope is the thing with feathers, but that's not my favorite. And I know my Emily Dickinson. I've had a serious Emily Dickinson Jones since I was nine years old and realized we had the same first name. 
And let's face it, Emily Dickinson was a lights out social distancer. She would have crushed it when it came to COVID culture. Anyway, my favorite Emily Dickinson line is actually this one. If I could stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. Which is the big reason why I'm back. Thanks for your patience with me. So, here we go. I admit that I am powerless over my addiction. Excuse me, addictions, plural. It's not just Jen. I am also addicted to not getting out of bed in the morning. That's pretty damn enticing too. And watching old movies. And not getting dressed other than putting on some makeup and a shirt that doesn't have vomit on it. I mean, I did two of my years of college in quarantine and online. My parents are very proud of me and think that's a hell of an accomplishment. It is. But you know what's an even bigger accomplishment? Becoming a sloppy drunk when there's no place to congregate with your college peers and you still manage to pound a four pack of Sip of Sunshine? You know who was really screwed by COVID-19 and COVID-20? The people who make beer kegs. Because after all, who in holy hell needed a beer keg in those days? <laughs> in any case, I'm back. I'm back because, not kidding, I started dating a guy and he's wonderful, but he's also really clear about one thing. The world is a mess and my being a drunk is not helping. It breaks his heart. Those are the words he used. I break his heart. It's not helping the planet and it's not helping us. His name is Darren. We met at COVID Commando. You know, we do the contact tracing, we make masks and we taught people how to zoom when that was a thing and now how to zipple. We do it all. We can solve your problems remotely, or we can swoop into your home in our hazmats and make sure you have what you need to cocoon. Today, Darren fixed the sound bar on a nice old man's TV system so he can once again set the volume to jet engine. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm shuttling a bunch of high school kids to COVIDCon. Shots, vitamins, N99s, make your own pandemic meme video booths. I love the COVID cons. Darren is exactly the kind of guy you want to fall in love with during a pandemic. During the last quarantine, he taught himself to bake. And I don't just mean chocolate chip cookies. He'd come to my apartment and make lemon squares and sour cream coffee cakes and bundt cakes. Together, we Marie kondo my kitchen. I had 27 coffee mugs. It's like they were rabbits multiplying the cabinet over the dishwasher. One person does not need 27 coffee mugs. I was a little afraid to come back, given my history of epic face plants, but Darren said you would be happy to see me. I think the chance to come here and be in the same space with actual human beings is another incentive to keep me sober. At least until the next lockdown shut down, shelter in place. And then, well, it's always five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> but this time I will try. I will really, really try. We may not be going to other galaxies in 2037, but I also don't have alien monsters with acid for blood on my 2037 bingo card. A girl can dream, right? To Darren, and to all of you, cheers.
Good morning. I am so honored to be here today, representing my home bioregion 17 and serving as coordinator for day two of our Covenant Day 2050 celebration and our 25th annual meeting. Welcome, all of you, all of you here before me in this hall and all of you who are participating virtually throughout the world. Thirty years ago, this gathering, this organization would not have been thought possible. I know many of you were not yet born in the year 2020, but even if you were not yet living on this earth, I know you've become very familiar with what is now called the awakening. Those remarkable years following that time of of great sickness of body and soul throughout the planet. A time that was so dark that many of us felt it meant the end of our existence. But through the collective will and wisdom of so many, in five short years, by 2025, we had had emerged into a clarity and a vision that has only grown through the past 25 years when we established our whole earth entity. <laughs> Each year we gather to celebrate the covenant, our founding document which declared that Laws alone would never save our planet, and that love was the only thing that could bind our humans to commit to saving ourselves from ourselves. Last night, at our opening ceremony, we gathered for the annual reading of the Covenant by our Supreme Justice, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But before she started her, her reading of the Covenant, she made an opening statement, and, and I would like to repeat just the first line now. One score and five years ago, our mothers and fathers brought forth on this planet a new entity conceived in love and dedicated to the proposition that all life is sacred. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it, it bears a, a stylistic similarity to the words of, of the American President Abraham Lincoln. But please keep in mind that when he spoke, his country was fighting a great civil war, a war that was tearing his country apart, a war that never really ended but merely evolved, as did the cause for which it was being fought, slavery itself. Today, we can say that we live in a world that has, has seen the end of racism, and the end of the exploitation of all living things. A world in which income based upon need is the norm, rather than the old way of accumulating wealth and then protecting it through greed and deception and brute force and unjust laws. A world where happiness, good health, and real security is acknowledged to be everyone's birthright. The next three days we will be discussing many important issues. The single question for today is, should men be allowed to sit on the leadership council? Now, shortly we will break into our smaller groups and we will discuss this. 
But before that, uh, earlier we asked you to submit questions or comments and I would like to share just a few of them with you at this time. Martin from uh, Bioregion 29 says, it's been 10 years since the Great Mutiny. I think men have been banned from the Leadership Council for long enough. I am sure we have evolved and that no male would ever again try to replace all the females in leadership with men. Mm -hmm. Next, we have um, Larry, Larry from um, Bioregion 45. Larry says, it's time we had equal representation. It's not as if a woman couldn't be a criminal. Remember Ben Ghazi. Seriously, Larry? Nadia from our Bioregion 36 says, men break things. Thank you for that reminder, Nadia. Habin from Bioregion 2 comments, I'm a 30-year-old male and I think the women are doing a great job. Why would a man want to be in charge? Thank you, Habin. Our keynote speaker tonight is our environmental minister, Greta Thunberg, and at our closing ceremony for the day, our new elected leader, Malala Yousafzai, will be honoring our retiring leader, Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Until we meet again, may we all truly hear each other, may we truly see each other, and may we hold the greater good in our thoughts and in our hearts. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jen Maxwell, and I'll be auditioning for for Sorry, I'm just a little bit nervous. Can I take a moment and start again? Hello, I'm Jen and... Whew, still really nervous. This is my first audition since, the, since everything shut down and, and that was like almost 11 years ago, right? What did I used to do with all these nerves at an audition? <laughs> Hello, again, I'm Jen, and I'll be... I can't really see you. Oh, there you are. Wow, I can't believe how big this theater is. It's huge. I've only ever really seen it from the audience. I just remembered what I used to do with all those nerves. I used to talk too much. I'm so glad I remembered that. Since I was nine, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to make people feel the way I felt sitting in that chair right there. But my school didn't do any theater. And my mother didn't have any money for private programs. So I started memorizing and performing dialogue from TV shows, movies, anything I could find. When my mom grew tired of listening to my Jessica Fletcher monologues from Murder, She Wrote, she gave me some Shakespeare plays. So many stories at my disposal. At the age of 15, 
I added another story to my collection. I wrote my own one-woman show, a mashup, Murder Most Foul, she wrote, in which I solved all of Shakespeare's murders while sipping tea. Back in early 2020, I auditioned for my dream role with this company that I was dying to work with. They were doing Macbeth, and I had always wanted to play Lady Mac... Shit! I am sorry, I forgot. You're not supposed to say Macbeth in a... Oh, shit! Anyway, I got the part. We had just started rehearsals and then everything began to close. I thought it was temporary. I mean, we all did, right? I eventually found some non-performance activities to occupy my time. I tried making kombucha and sourdough bread. I mean, who didn't? I kept waiting for theater to come back. I mean, the theater that I loved. I waited and waited. After a few months, I realized theater wasn't coming back. Once I accepted this fact, I let myself be sad. Really sad. Problem was, when I'm sad, I usually go to the theater. It cheers me up. It can pull me from the abyss no matter how lost I am. I can escape into another world, a world where I can laugh, cry, sing, and even a terrible play can occupy me because I'm lost in thinking, what the hell went wrong? I am thrilled this decade-long hiatus from theater is finally over. I think we all benefited from the giant pause. I know I did. It allowed me, us, to figure out our priorities. I think theater needed it too. It needed to take inventory, to make sure that it was telling the stories that we crave, the stories that we need, the ones that are really relevant to our lives. Hello, I'm Jen Maxwell, and I'll be auditioning for the role of the woman. Character description, the only female part in the play. Caucasian, preferably not too large, size zero, goddess, girl next door type, hot but still a virgin, must have leading lady acting ability, non-speaking role, oh, and, and she has a sexy laugh. For my monologue, should I just do a minute of, of sexy laughs? <laughs> oh, fuck. I am grateful to Dean Morrison for it. the invitation to give what she calls my farewell address to the college. <laughs> As, uh, as many of you realize, I do know a, a thing or two about the history of this college. <laughs> I have watched generations of college students walk in and out. And I dare say I began my freshman year at a college not unlike Barrington. Uh, it was 1966. Can you believe I was alive in 1966? Can I believe it? <laughs> well, I was. 
and it was a very good year, so to speak. LBJ was president, and the, oh, the escalation of the war in Vietnam had barely started. No, it would take another two years for that savagery and madness to take hold, as we watched young men being mowed down night after night on the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Blood and guts in Technicolor. It was stunning, and it turned the tide of public opinion. And soon we were marching in the streets. I joined in. We, we marched on Washington, on the Capitol. It was quite shocking. Well, at least it was shocking to my parents. <laughs> the 60s slid into the early 70s, and I believed, silly me, that love and peace would descend like doves and land on everybody's shoulders. That a green world had begun. <laughs> Make love, not war. Dick Nixon before Nixon dicks you. <laughs> but then came the 80s. At the me decade. Uh, yes, and I, I recall uh, having tea with a student in his dorm room. Uh, this uh, student was an economic major, and he had a poster of Donald Trump on his wall. The art of the deal had captured his imagination. <laughs> oh, how little we realized what would come in just a few decades. Oh, I miss the 60s. I miss the students calling the question again and again, forcing their elders to state their positions. It was a brave new world, as the bard once nicely put it. And I felt it slipping away. <laughs> Slip slide in away. At least the uh, the hopeful aspects. And by the nineties, it was all wrong. The uh, <clears throat> the more conservative people in uh, my generation of college students went into politics or business and wound up at the White House, in Congress, in local government, on Wall Street. They took control. Whereas people with more revolutionary ideas like me went not into government, but into English departments. Oy vey. As the saying goes. <laughs> After the disaster of 9-11 in 2001, we found ourselves with a mess on our hands. An idiot president invaded Iraq in what he called a war of choice. The ensuing calamity was predictable and yes, predicted, but yet it happened. And we killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians and displaced a million more or so and destabilized the Middle East for decades. And it is still a catastrophe. <laughs> but hope kept popping up. You remember Bill Clinton, the man from hope? Do you remember President Obama? Yes, we can. Well, we couldn't. Or didn't. <laughs> I am glad to say that the Trump years were a brief interlude of madness. The worst instincts of our country were given voice and we all pay dearly.
That was before many of you were born. Hmm. It is good to be here among so many young people, all so hopeful still. I always say, the American people got a good start in the late 18th century. Our founding fathers were bright and their ideas stirring. But where did they go? At least in 2026, the Supreme Court finally understood that the Second Amendment did not give every Tom, Dick, and Harry the right to own an automatic weapon of mass destruction. One flintlock per household. That's what they meant. The framers of our founding documents. And it is good that you do not remember that crazy people used to gun down kids in schools, innocent people in shopping malls, at movies. In auditoriums. So, yeah, a few good things did happen. It was too bad about the bomb. We should have understood that she cannot play with nuclear weapons and not get hurt. How many people died? Um, uh, <coughs> I, I, I won't go there. As this is my uh, swan song and meant to be sweet. But you'll forgive me if I say I told you so. We, we were spared in this part of the country, and there has been some effort to restore normality in the last decade. Your parents and grandparents will explain. Oh dear, I should end on a note of hope, shouldn't I? Well, uh, we are on a better path now. The Electoral College is at last a thing of the past, and, and, and nobody would, would dream of running for public office without some humility, am I right? Look around. Look around you. See your friends and ask yourself what you can do to serve them and not yourself. I ask you. No. I beg you only to read books again. You will find them in the basements of the library in special collections and they let you take them out for a few days. Once people held them in their hands without thinking it an amazement. Remember computers? Oh, your parents will explain. Oh, yes, museums display them proudly. Look at what used to hold our attention. <laughs> what? You couldn't just talk to your friends by yelling into your palm? <laughs> Books just didn't appear fully absor absorbed and neatly shelved in the lobes of your cerebral cortex. <laughs> I quote again, oh, brave new world. I wish I could teach for another 10 years. But um, my eyes are weak, and my spirit less than perfectly aligned with the current age. So, uh, so thank you for coming to say goodbye to me today. Not farewell. Just uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>